Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 32nd Annual MLK Malmstrom Lecture in Physics here at Hamlin University. I am Dr. Fanny Smiller, President of Hamlin University. I want to begin by taking a moment to acknowledge and honor one of our legendary alumni, Carl Malmstrom. After the passing of his wife, Emma K. Malmstrom, he endowed this lecture series as a tribute to her and the life they spent together. Carl was a constant figure at this annual event, all the way up until his death in 2010 at the age of 97. Carl Malmstrom was a physics and mathematics major and graduated from Hamlin in 1936. After receiving his degree from Hamlin, he received a physics degree in 1938 from Syracuse University. Carl's early scientific career was interrupted by World War II. He was a decorated naval aviator who served in the Pacific Theater and North Africa. Once out of the service, Carl put his physics degree to work. He played an important role in the development of atomic energy. He was instrumental in the formation of the Atomic Energy Department, worked for the Atomic Energy Commission, and on the H-bomb. Throughout his career, Carl was a highly regarded physicist and recognized for his many significant contributions to the field. Carl endowed this lecture as a way of not only honoring his wife, Emma K. Malmstrom, but as a way to give back to Hamlin University. Providing us, with the means to camp, providing us with the means to bring to campus some of the best scientific minds in the world. Over the years, Hamlin has hosted many renowned scientists and provided students, faculty, staff, and the public the opportunity to talk to those renowned scientists and learn from them. When Carl was in attendance at the dinners and lectures, I am told he enthusiastically enjoyed the lectures always sitting front row center as if he could hardly wait to ask a question or lend some humor. Arlene Pontinen has made sure that we remember Carl and showing us pictures of Carl and all of his colleagues um, who were at Hamlin at that time. We honor Carl for his generous gifts to Hamlin and celebrate his legacy and his love for Emma and this lecture. This, will, this we will continue to do for many years to come. We are very proud of our science programs here at Hamlin and the outstanding students we attract. These students walk in the footsteps of people like Carl Malmstrom, and they themselves go, go on to illustrious careers where they make a difference in the world. There are many distinguishing qualities for our physics programs here at Hamlin. One of the more important is the opportunity for students to work closely with faculty on groundbreaking research. It is now my pleasure to introduce a faculty member who's dedicated to helping students hone on in on their interests and develop skills necessary for lifelong learning. Professor Li Fang Dong, he has been at Hamlin since 2015, and he will introduce the Emma, this year's M.A.K. Malmstrom Lecturer in Physics. Professor Dong holds the Emma K. and Carl R. N. Malmstrom Endowed Chair in Physics at Hamlin University. He received his PhD and MS degree in physics from Portland State University. After completing his MS in material science and engineering and mechanical engineering at Qingdao University of Science and Technology in China. Professor Dong is a recipient of 22 patents and has published over 340 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. An award-winning researcher, Professor Dong currently works with his collaborators and students on the design, synthesis, and characterization of nanoscale materials and devices for renewable energy conversion and storage, as well as other water purification and desalination projects. It is my honor to present to you Professor Li Fang Dong. Good evening. Hello. Hello, good evening. <laughs> For this 32nd annual K Mamcha Lecture in Physics, it is my distinct honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. John Martinez. Dr. Martinez is a physics professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. 
and a pioneer in the field of quantum computing. He pioneered experiments in superconducting qubit in the mid-1980s and has worked on a variety of low-temperature device physics through his career. In 2014, Dr. Martinez was awarded the Fritz London Prize in low-temperature physics. From 2014 to 2020, he worked at Google to build a useful quantum computer. And in 2019, he led a team that achieved quantum supremacy, a major milestone in the development of quantum computer. For his innovations in the design and control of superconducting devices and leadership, he was awarded the John Steele Bell Prize in 2021. You may, from my introduction, you hear a lot of buzzwords, right? I think you are going to learn all those buzzwords from Professor Martinez. Please join me in welcoming Professor Martinez. Is this working okay? Good. Uh, thank you very much for your very kind invitation uh, to come speak today and coming out and uh, learning about physics. I, I, it's a great honor to talk about physics and this experiment. Um, computing is part of our everyday lives. It's incredibly important for science and technology and, you know, obviously a big impact on our uh, everyday lives. Maybe too much of an impact, we might argue. Um, and then this, this dinner, we were talking about chat GPT and how it affects the university. But to get to those kind of powerful computers, they really needed a supercomputer to train that model. And just give you a size, it's about $100 million in software, in hardware, and then they train this over months of times to get these very best models. So supercomputers are a big part of technology advance today. And what I want to do is talk today about maybe a new kind of supercomputer that if you just go beyond the regular laws of classical physics that's all around us and use quantum physics, you might be able to store and manipulate information in a much more powerful way than what we can do you know, regularly. And now it's not for every problem, but there's really an interesting class of problems where it can very much impact all of our lives. So we want to talk today, just starting out, just give a brief description of what this is about, all about, how it works. Talk about the particular technology we use here for superconducting qubits. You can see the experiment uh, right here. And then finally, go a little bit more technical, but you know, we have to, to really understand the experiment. And the quantum supremacy experiment, we basically ran a mathematical algorithm that's not useful yet, but it does show that the quantum computer is powerful. So that we run the quantum computer for a couple minutes, and if we want to check if it got the right answer, that would take thousands of years, a very long time, just showing, you know, indeed how powerful that quantum computer is. And we think it's the basis for many other advances that we're going to need to do to make this useful. So first of all, you know, let's talk about quantum mechanics and because that's the basis of what we're doing our computing with. And I'm going to give an example of a hydrogen atom. And if you remember from your physics or chemistry course, you have a proton which is positively charged and electron negatively charged, they are attracted to each other and form the hydrogen atom. Now, the first question you really need to ask is, well, why do atoms have size? Because you think of these kind of as point particles that are going to be attracted. Why do molecules have size? And obviously, if you look around the room, the atoms of molecules we, we are in have size to it. And it's because of quantum mechanics <clears> that gives it a very unusual behavior to this electron. So instead of the electron just sticking to the proton, it's attracted to it, but the electron has size. It's not a, part, a point particle. 
I used to tell my young kids that electrons were fuzzy, and that's why, you know, atoms have size. They never really believed me on that, even though, you know, they, the physicists. And uh, more, more accurately, uh, the electrons, because of quantum mechanics, don't want to be a part of point particle. That's not really how they work. And they actually form some kind of standing wave around this uh, positive uh, nucleus. And the standing wave, you draw schematically, it's, it's this little red cloud that's around, the, around the, pro, the proton. And the electron is at all the different positions around this particle at the same time. It's not at one point, it's at many points at the same time. And that cloud, uh, of course, the size of the cloud gives you the size of the atom. Now, in uh, quantum mechanics, this cloud it's not like just the electrons moving around randomly, but it's a really specific state that's described by a, a standing wave, okay? And that it turns out with that standing wave, you can have more excited, more complicated standing waves. So instead of the 1s state, you can have the 2p or the 2p or 2s states. And if you think about how the uh, periodic table is created, it's by adding electrons to more and more complicated nuclei, uh, giving all these different kind of states. So what we're going to do in the quantum uh, world for quantum computation is use this particular state, 1s, which is the ground state, which is normally what you'd see in hydrogen, but also see this excited state here that has a little bit more complicated wave nature to it uh, that the atom likes to go into also and we're gonna encode that as the one state. We're gonna abstract away these quantum states and talk about zero and one, okay? Because these are the natural states that you wanna get in a quantum mechanical system. Now, when we have classical information, we store and manipulate that information as a zero and one. And then you pull that together and you do complicated manipulations on that and you can get your computer to do very uh, amazing things. Um, what happens in quantum mechanics, this quantum states that I just told you about, it's very different than classical states, which it can be either a zero or a one and then manipulated in our computer, but it can be both zero and one at the same time. And just as an electron could be at different places around the proton at the same time, these particular quantum states can be at two distinct states at the same time. So that's just the feature of quantum mechanics due to what's called superposition. Now, how do you, you can use that fact of superposition. It's something that nature gives us that you don't get in regular uh, uh, classical mechanics, a regular computer, but nature gives you this. And the way we use this, in a very nice way, is we can take the state of zero plus one, take that state, and then run it through a computation, a complex computation. We're gonna have to measure it at the end. But we're able to do a kind of parallel processing where we can find the answer of zero, and we can find the answer of one. So those two conditions, running through the computer once. So it's a parallel processing power of a factor of two. Okay, with one qubit. So that sounds nice, it's very academic. Okay, why would that be useful? What is gets useful is if you do more complicated things. Let's say you have two atoms, and each of them are in the zero plus one state. If you do some simple algebra that's true for quantum computers, you now have four possible states of the system. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And now with two qubits, quantum bits, you can run through four possible input states and then run it through once and have a four times parallel computation. So I, I think you could see that, let's say we had three, then we're going to have eight states all the possible combinations, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, et cetera. 
Three cubits is eight, four would be 16, 532. You see the power of the quantum computer in this parallel computing manner is going up exponentially. Two as the number of qubits you have. Very, very rapidly increasing. And for n equal 50, 2 to the 50, that amount of parallelism gives you the power of a supercomputer. And if we can build a 300 qubit quantum computer and operate it properly, then 2 to the 300 is a number that are more states, these is, this is more, more states than there are atoms in the universe. Okay? So that's a ca computation with a quantum computer you can never do with a regular computer, no matter how big you want it to do. Now let me mention, that sounds great, really exciting. In the end, you take these 300 uh, qubits, quantum bits, and you have to measure at the end, and you get 300 zeros or ones. You get 300 bits of information. And you can't really extract all the two to 300 parallel processing that goes through it. And it means that you have to design very careful algorithms to be able to extract that information in the right way that'll be useful. So it's not like it's gonna replace every, uh, every program on your computer. But there are certain programs, certain algorithms where it's going to be useful. And let's talk a little bit about uh, that. Um, it turns out, historically, when you looked at quantum computing, the first algorithm that was invented was something called factoring, which is basically the backbone of all the, most all the security that you run on your computer on the internet. And the idea is, is you can take two very large prime numbers and uh, find those prime numbers and multiply them together and that's not too hard to do. And then use that number as a security, because if you pass that information, someone looking at that big number can't break it down into the two prime integers again. And that's a very hard problem. It's easy to, to, uh, to multiply numbers together, but it's very hard to factor. And that asymmetry is based on now, that's how uh, you know, most all of the practical uh, systems we're doing now, um, eventually if we build a quantum computer, it's gonna break that, and we're gonna lose our internet security, which is a big deal. Fortunately, people know about this since 1990s or so, and they're researching quantum-resistant uh, protocols. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna be safe. They're gonna be able, there's new ways to do this, all security has a lifetime. You know, it's time to move on to something else. That'll be okay. What is more exciting, however, is um, figuring out how you can use a quantum computer to advance humanity, okay? And I think the, the one application I'm most interested in is in quantum chemistry. Because if it turns out if you want to simulate how a big molecule works, you're gonna go to a supercomputer but that's a very hard problem to simulate because it's based on quantum mechanics. And for this same reason that the quantum computer can be powerful, I told you about, makes it very hard, exponentially hard, to simulate on a classical computer. So they can do uh, molecules up to maybe uh, 50 uh, atoms or so, maybe a little bit longer, depending on the things you do. But if you want to do it more accurately, you want to look at bigger systems, you're going to want to do this with a quantum computer. And uh, although I say there's a natural mapping of qubits to electron bonds, okay, that's both quantum mechanics, it has taken several decades to figure out how to do that, but the theorists know, know how to do that. I think there'll be a lot of technical applications. Let's say you want to build better batteries, okay? Uh, right now, if you build it out of cobalt, there's not enough cobalt in the world to electrify the world. So uh, we can do that. Then algorithms are known, they're useful and powerful. They kind of know how, what we have to build. We have to build a million qubit system. Right now we're at 100, so it's going to take a few years to get there. But uh, people kind of know how to do that. A second application is optimization which would be a very wide application uh, field. 
And one example of this is the traveling salesman problem. You have, for example, a series of cities that a salesman wants to visit, and you want to know what order in which to visit the cities that will give you the shortest length. And that's a huge combination problem mathematically that's hard to do. But um, the idea is that with quantum mechanics, roughly thinking about you look at all the possible uh, uh, paths and figure out the best one from that superposition, uh, you might be able to do that. Um, although there's known algorithms to speed this up in optimization, it's only for quantum data. We don't quite yet know the application for practical problems like this, but people are doing on that, doing working on this hard. And there's, there's a lot of ideas that even if it's uh, more heuristic uh, algorithm, not to say not the real provable algorithm, people will be able to find some advantage to it. So it's a big application area. Now, I'm not a theorist, so I'm not going to speak too much more about the algorithms. I'm going to talk about how to build it. And the first thing you can do is say, well, if a hydrogen atom or a carbon atom, you can look at quantum mechanics of that system. What you want to do is build a molecule, okay, some complicated molecule, and then use the electron interactions between all of this to somehow build a quantum computer. And people, in fact, started this with nuclear magnetic resonance techniques. In the very early days, they did that. But you can immediately see the problem. If you want to have a, a quantum bit of this atom right here, and there's a quantum bit of this atom right here, how are you going to control this one without not, with not controlling this one in some way? And the problem, for example, is if you like, the size of light is a thousand times bigger than this molecule. So it's hard to isolate one atom to the next. And you know that's where, uh, because of that problem, people have to, have to be very clever about how they want to invent to build a quantum computer. And it turns out that there's many ways to potentially do it. It's a very vibrant and, and varied ecosystem right now on, on how to do that. There's many physical systems. So this is a picture of, uh, we'll come to in a minute on superconductors. You can use uh, one electron removed from an atom, uh, say a beryllium atom, uh, and then that charged particle you can put in a very special metal configuration in vacuum to trap it there and do the individual uh, operations, and then those ions are far enough apart so that you control them with light. You can actually use light itself and build light chips to do that, to, to interact with light in some way. Semiconductors, even diamond, some defects in diamond. There's other kind of uh, annealer kind of architecture people look, looking at. So there's a large number of things that people are looking at. Large companies, startups, government labs, universities, a lot of ideas out there, a lot of ways to make that. And you know, I, I actually started this in a university uh, in the 1980s, and then I was in a government lab in the 2000s, uh, and then uh, in a large company, as we talked about, I'm now working in a startup. So, you know, it's been really fun to develop this in a bunch of different situations. Okay, so this gets a little bit more detailed about how we program the quantum computer, okay? And this is an analogy to how you program electronics. In electronics, you can have operations where you take, you know, two bits of information and you interact them some way in something called a gate, like an AND gate, an OR gate, or an XOR gate. And this involves a handful of transistors to be able to do that. And then you put these gates together to create more complex functions. So for example, this particular six, uh, uh, circuit here adds A and B and gives you the sum and then gives you a carry that comes out of it. And you can also have a carry in and carry out to make this really wide. And you know, much of your arithmetic functions in your computer is basically based on this kind of idea. Now in quantum, there's a similar kind of circuit language that we have, where we have our qubits, 
and then they, let's say they're initialized in the zero state. And then we can do a single qubit operation on them, like creating zero to zero plus one state. And then uh, you can have a two qubit operations where the qubits interact in some way, just like these kind of classical operations of AND and OR gates. And instead of just having the electronic signals flow less to right in time over space of these, these things here, there are specific time steps of these operations, much like a computer program, where uh, you know this is your first instruction, this is your second instruction, this is your third instruction, and so forth. And you do the sequence of instructions over time. And, all, and it's proven, you've proven that if you take classical circuits and you have an AND gate and a NOT gate, you can make any circuit you want. Every circuit in here is made, basically made out of those gates, just built up. There's a similar uh, kind of thing you could do here from single qubit gates and two qubit gates. You can do any calculation you want. So as a physicist, you know, we say, okay, let's start off making these gates, making sure we know how to do it, and eventually we'll do it more and more complex algorithms, and I'll show that later, okay? Now, this is where I make a big transition, okay? So far I've been talking to you how quantum computer works, why it's interested, people are doing it. Now I want to talk to the few, to a few of you who might want to be investing in a quantum computer company, okay? And I'm gonna give you uh, two words of advice, okay? The first word of advice is never take investment advice from a physicist. <laughs> Except if you're Elon Musk, then it's okay, okay. But the second uh, word, of, uh, word of advice is if you're gonna think about quantum computing, you have to think about errors, think about things go wrong. Because what happens is when you do computation here, you basically do it error-free. Okay, every once in a while, you know, you get, a, uh, you get something going wrong. It's usually a software problem or something, but the hardware is really pretty reliable, and fundamentally so, whereas in, in qubits, it's not. And I want to just explain that with a very simple uh, example. And I'm going to represent classical information, a zero or one. I, here it's a coin, but who, does anyone have a coin in their pocket? I don't think so. So I'm going to use the cell phone, okay? And the, the, the glass up, I'm going to represent, that's a zero state. And the other way around is a one state. Now when I represent and encode data this way, a physical system, this is a very simple system and stable, simple but stable system. If I jiggle my hand a little bit, it may start to turn up a little bit, but there's a restoring force and there's energy loss, whatever, so it stays at zero or one, unless I put in a certain amount of energy to flip it, and I want to flip it, but it's a stable system. For a quantum bit, it's the same kind of thing here, where this is the zero and this is the one, but now it could be at any rotation angle. In fact, the zero plus one state that I talked about before was this actually rotating halfway in between. And it turns out with quantum states, you can have a rotation this way called phase that uh, it added complication, but that's, it's important there. And for the physicists there, this is known as the block sphere representation. Now you see that since this can be in any orientation, there's no restoring force keeping it here. So if you have a small amount of noise coming into your system, you know, a puff of wind here, it's gonna take this and rotate it a little bit and it's gonna give you an error. So uh, it turns out, and this is not a bad analogy, it turns out that qubits are fundamentally um, prone to errors from, doing, from, from having this. Now you can operate your system at low temperatures and other things so that it doesn't have much error. And you know, it's actually not bad, but you have to, you have to realize you can't make it zero error like you can for a, a classical computer. And that really changes everything how you, you think about this. 
So just to give you an example of what errors do, this is classical circuits. In the 1960s, uh, you could buy these kind of circuits, uh, but um, they were hard to manufacture. And you would have an, an error every 100 transistors or so, so for a big circuit, you had an error rate of a chip working of maybe 10 to minus 3, maybe a little bit higher than that. But then they would test it and throw the bad ones away, and then you could build something. You know, what is it? 60 years later, after all this tech, billions, trillions of dollars, you now have circuits where your error rate per transistor is maybe a part in 10 billion or 100 billion. So you have very complex processors that go in here. And you can live with that and do that fine. And that's because it's you know fundamentally stable, you can do that. In quantum, you can have fabrication errors, but there are intrinsic errors of this device that's of order you know, 1% or so. So you try to do an operation, let's say, that flips the zero state to the zero plus one state, and about 1% of the time, you'll get some other state here. And, uh, you know, okay, so you have to live with that. Uh, what ha what's happening right now is people are talking about systems with 100 qubits or so. So you see it's 100 qubits per operation here. But if the error is one part in 100 operations, this is the investment advice, <laughs> then you can do one or two or three operations before the quantum computer is going to have an error. That's not very useful, a three instruction set program. Okay, and people are marketing that in the field. So what, you know, our company, what people recognize, whatever, you have to bring the error rate down. And if you bring it down to like 10 to minus four, which we think we could do, it's hard. Then you can have an instruction set that's a few hundred instructions long, and then you can start doing something interesting and useful. Okay, so that's what I think is the big thing that has to be done in the field. Uh, and, uh, you know, people are working on it, we understand that, but it, it's a little bit hard. Okay. So with that, that's kind of the background, let's talk in about how we're doing it, how this quantum supremacy experiment works. And this is our superconducting qubits that we're making. So this is a, a device that we make on a silicon wafer, using the standard, we go into a clean room and use the standard tools that people use. And in this, the tan color is aluminum, and the black color, black right here, is where the aluminum has been etched away. Okay, and this size, this is uh, a millimeter, is about this size on it. So it's small, but not too small. You can see it with your bare eyes if you wanted to. And the nice thing about this is this is macroscopic now. It's not, you know, atoms wide. If we want to bring in control wires to control what's going on electrically here, we just do that with you know, our lithography that we know how to do. Also, this is used as electrical engineering concepts, like you're thinking about capacitors and inductors, and we know how to engineer and think about very carefully. And again, it's built like a computer chip. So that helps you in, in building this in a, in, a, in a reasonable way, using Lots of technology tools we have out there. Uh, oops. And just to get a little bit more detail, um, what this little cross here, right here, it's, there's, an ins there's a separated by an insulator, that forms a capacitor. And right here, these little Josephson junctions, which are aluminum wires that are crossed, uh, and uh, there's about 0.1 micron thick, so they're very thin, a little aluminum oxide insulating barrier, and electrons, Cooper pairs, tunnel through that. This gives you an inductor. So we basically made a capacitor inductor resonance circuit. Okay, and that's what our qubit is coming from. And if you wanna think about the resonance circuit just like, a, let's say, an oscillating pendulum, we basically encode the zero state as the ground state, where it's not oscillating semi-classically and has a wave function kind of like I showed with the hydrogen atom, like this. And then we put one quantum energy, h bar omega worth of energy into it, 
and then we get the one state, which is oscillating uh, mildly, and has a wave function kind of looking like the wave function we saw with the hydrogen atom. And then these are our two states. We encode it this way, and we put on microwave pulses coming into here to make transitions between that and control what the state is, okay? So it's electrical circuit. So um, this is uh, the qubit operation. Uh, uh, here's a circuit diagram. Uh, we start, we just let, we wait a long time and the circuit goes into a ground state. We then pulse this with microwave. Sorry, the little pulse is gone. But this just, just puts a microwave pulse for a variable amount of time. And then that creates a, a excitation from the zero state to the one state, because the microwaves are tuned exactly to the oscillation frequency. And that puts energy into it. We then measure it. We don't have time to talk about that. We get a zero or one. And then you average that 1,000, 10,000 signs or so to get a probability. So this is the curve that we get for the data versus the time that we turn these microwave pulses on. At zero time, this goes all the way to probability of one to be in the zero state. That's how we reset it. And then you see when you put in uh, 20 nanoseconds, you go a zero state to a one state. And we call that in classical computing a not gate, zero to one. Now, not gate of one goes to zero, and if you see if you pulse it for an additional 20 nanoseconds, you get back to the zero state. So a not and a not is identity, it doesn't do anything. Um, but what's interesting about this, instead of pulsing it for 20 nanoseconds, you can also pulse it for 10. And here, if you measure it, that's 50% zero and one, and that's exactly this zero plus one state I've been talking about the whole time. This is the interesting state, okay? And we call that a square root of not gate, so that if you have a 20, 10 nanosecond pulse square root of not, and if 10 nanosecond pulse is square root or not, square root or not times square root or odd is a not. Just like a not times a not is the identity. Now, if you were to talk to computer engineers and say, well, I have this great square root of not gate, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Like, you know, what does that mean? Okay, and quantum mechanics gives you an, ex an ex expanded instruction set on how to do computations on numbers. It's not just the simple, you know, Boolean algebra that people learn in computer science courses and computer courses, but you have an expanded set. And that expanded set, nature allows you to do things like square or not. And that's where you get the power of the quantum computer with. You're, you're given more opportunities to create this algorithm. And, uh, you know, so, so you can do that. I do want to say here, if you do a bunch of square root of not, if you do a bunch of not gates, this oscillates up and down. But you see, this is lifted a little bit off the floor here. This is a little bit lower here. The fact that this is not the same is the errors I've been talking about. And you can see that if you were to extend this to about 20 microseconds or so, then this amplitude gets very small, and then your quantum computer essentially loses its memory stops working. So you have a finite number of operations you can do in a quantum computer, as I said before. And this is just showing you the data where that's the case. Okay. By the way, this particular curve was taken 10 or 12 years ago. That took about 20 years to get something looking so good by myself and a lot of people in the field. This, 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 this is a lot of work to get that figured out and get it to work properly. So for the quantum supremacy experiment, we built a processor where, you know, we made these devices in a clean room, but once you make one and learn how to make it really well, you can make a bunch of them. So this is a processor with 54 qubits. The cross in here is the qubit, and then the, the uh, blue uh, rectangle here is something we use to couple one qubit to the next and we can turn that on and off, okay? And it's put in this square array, and this is a good, exam, good way to build it because it's forward, exam, 
compatible to doing things we want to do in the future. And this is the chip where we made it. This is about one centimeter squared here, and this is where all the qubits are. And then underneath this is basically a wiring layer, which takes it from all the wiring we need internally here and brings it out to about 150 pads or so to the outside, where we're going to connect that into wires and control it, to microwave wires and control it. And then these two chips are what's called bump bonded together, where there's some little spots of indium that you compress that, that you, when you squeeze together, it forms a good bond. So this is all built in a clean room and using very sophisticated tools to get all this right. But this is what's known in the semiconductor industry, so it works quite well. So we fabricate the chip, we put it into a chip mount, which is about this big, which has wiring from the edge of the chip here to these microwave connectors on the outside. And then these, this whole chip mount is put right in the center here, and then you have a ton of wires, you know, a couple hundred, 150, 200 wires uh, going from the chip, uh, then going up to our control electronics. And this is put in something we call a dilution refrigerator, uh, which operates at about a hundredth of a Kelvin. So remember, room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. So this is one part in 10 to 10,000 of room temperature. It's very, very cold. But you just buy that, right? People know how to build this. A lot of nice physics in it. And it turns out that the energy, thermal energy at 10 millikelvin, that energy, which is k Boltzmann times t, is much less than the quantum energy of these systems, which is Planck's constant times 5 gigahertz, so that the noise from the thermal energy here doesn't swamp out your quantum computer and you can get, get it to work. So, you know, you, you have to do that. So, uh, you know, we can go to higher temperatures, but we want, we, we then would have to go to higher frequencies, and five gigahertz is great because there's a lot of microwave components from your cell phone and cell phone towers so that we can build the electronics easily. So it's easier to operate at a low frequency than it is at a high frequency, but then we have to go to low temperatures, but we just buy it, okay? So that's the trade-off. And then all these wires go up to the room temperature and then goes into racks of electronics where we have digital, we have microwave generators that are controlled by a big computer program, custom built high speed, high precision, and you know, that's how well we control it. And of course this is, this reminds you of a high energy physics experiment. But physicists know how to build this. We know how to build software for it. It's uh, just a lot of good engineering to get that to work. Um, just for the experts, and now we're going to get a little bit more technical. I'll go a little bit faster. Just for the experts here, this is how our adjustable coupler works. This is a schematic of our uh, uh, junction which is an LC resonator, we put another one inside, and then we can control this in order to turn on and off the coupling between qubits. And you can see this in this diagram where here, the oscillating between the dark and light uh, here is representing energy from one qubit sloshing to another uh, uh, qubit and then sloshing back. For those of you in physics, this is your standard couple oscillator problem that you've studied, I don't know, second, first, second year, third year, classic physics problem, that's what we use, it's just in the quantum regime. And then if we adjust the current through this, you see here that that oscillation is turned off, and then the qubits are isolated. So uh, this is just an adjustable coupled oscillator, and that allows us to make the two qubit gates. Again, this is pretty uh, technical, we have to measure our errors in the qubits. And this is actually kind of interesting, and this is something kind of new we did. You can build this big qubit chip, and you can say, what's the error of the single qubit operation? Kind of like what I showed before on this qubit. And then you can try this other qubit here and this other qubit here, and you get some kind of average error that's pretty good. This corresponds, you can do, 
about 500 operations before you make an error. But like when you operate a real computer, you have to operate, you have to have all the transistors operating in parallel, or a good fraction of them operate in parallel to do something uh, powerful. So we also operate the device where we're doing these single qubit operations all at the same time, okay? And it's not obvious at all that when you operate one, or you operate all 53, that you're gonna get good results. But that's what this little curve right here, between the dash line and the solid line, is the solid line is operating them all at the same time, and the errors are more or less the same, okay? You could do a similar thing between the operation where we're swapping back and forth between two qubits and the two qubit gates, that's this dash line here and this dash line. It gets a little bit worse. A little errors are a little bit higher. And that's because it's a more complicated um, system. So, you know, you, you have to know that. But of course, the question you have is, it's like in here, you can get individual transistors to work well, but what happens when you build a big circuit and do you really expect everything to be working all together? I guess that's like you can have your individual, this is a music hall, you can have the individual musicians playing their part totally fine, but when they get together and, and play a, a symphony, are they all synced and, and working right and, and doing things so that the end result sounds good? You don't know, it takes practice to do that, it takes effort to do that, and that's what we want to know, and that, that was one of the big things we figured out so now we talk about, okay, the, the, the algorithm we ran, okay? And uh, this is the control sequence of all the 53 qubits that we ran. And the single bubble is when we do the single operation, like I was talking about with that one not gate. And then when we have a line between them, that's a two qubit operation uh, that we use to connect the qubits together to do a more accomplished. And if you just sequence through this, and this is kind of a spatial diagram of five qubits in the center, we sequ sequence through single qubits and two qubits, you can then do an arbitrary calculation. So that, that's how we, we, you just do that, you just have to program in what all these operations are, and then you can do whatever calculation it is. It's just like writing your instruction sets for your, your, your your uh, Python or your, your binary instructions for a computer. So that, that's what we do. Now the particular algorithm that we're making, I want to describe next so you understand it. This is getting a little bit technical, but I think it's okay. What we're doing here to check and test this quantum computer, it's kind of unusual. We're building a random number generator. Okay, and um, uh, we're, we're having this, this, uh, this whole sequence here. We choose random gates, these square root and odd gates, they have different phases, different directions. We have this. We have a series of known but random operations, and by doing those random operations, we expect to see all the possible random combinations at the end. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, et cetera, all of them. Now, that doesn't sound very useful, but it turns out if we want to, you know, use this to check a quantum computer and show we can do something powerfully, there's something very interesting about these random numbers. It's not completely random, these random numbers. There's a small amount of unrandomness in here, that we can use to check the quantum computer. And the way to understand that is this little diagram here of laser speckle. If you take a laser beam coming out of here and you have it go through a frosted glass, the frosting of it will spread out the laser beam. So when it does that, there's a width to this laser beam. In some directions, when you spread it out, the waves will come, of the laser, of the light, will come out in phase with each other, and then the light intensity will add, and it'll be bright. But in some directions, the waves will come out 
and be in opposite directions of their fields, and then it'll subtract and it'll be dark. And you can see that in this particular laser speckle that I came, pulled off the web, that some of the directions are bright and some of the directions are dark. And whether it's bright or dark depends exactly how it's going through the frosted glass. So if you move the frosted glass a little bit, all that changes. So the same thing that's happening here, we're getting this massive interference, and then we get the, the answer here. Some of those answers are bright. They have higher probability because it's added in the waves. And some, and some of those answers are be dimmer, less probability, because they, uh, it's, it's been subtracted. And the way we do is we check for this is we just take this and measure, measure it with our quantum computers. We get the certain numbers that come out of here. And those are the high probability numbers. And then we take the same thing and we run this through a supercomputer that computes what should be here. And you get the various probabilities, and some are bright or some are, are dim. And then we do something called cross entropy, where we take the, the answers we got and we plug in the probability here. And if everything works right, these should be the high probabilities. If it doesn't work right, that probability is 1 over 2 to the n, it's just the average. So if we take uh, 2 to the n times this minus 1, it'll give 0. If there's a problem, there's an error, and it'll get, actually, when you work out the math, it gives you a one when it went through properly. And the nice thing about this is that if you make any error here, so you ran the experiment, but somehow you put in the wrong gate here because you made a coding mistake, you'll get an error there and you'll get a zero. So it's a really good experiment in the sense that if you, if you don't get a good result, you know that something went wrong and you have to tra trace for it and track it. So any error at all. And it basically allows you to say whether the whole system on its own is playing together and creating the right you know, symphony of noises okay, that it's supposed to be generating, or if it's you know, giving kind of some totally unexpected random output uh, and it's telling you it's not working. So that's the basic idea. So, okay, so here's the data. This is number of qubits up to 53. This is this fidelity that I was talking about. And if you only use about 12 qubits, uh, you have about 250 gates total, and about 50% of the time it works. And you get the, you, you know, you get a, you, so on the average you get a fidelity about a half. Okay, so it's working. And then uh, this is for the full circuit. And then as you make, you add more and more qubits to your circuit, it goes down. Because the more qubits you have, the more errors you're gonna have. So it's not gonna work, uh, you know, work as well. And we can see that it's non-zero all the way out to 53 qubits or so. And uh, here, it takes a laptop to test it. And here's a workstation, and then at the end, you're on a big Google data center to check that last point. And that's the point of the quantum supremacy experiment, that you, know, you can take the data and doing that, but to really check it takes a long time. And there's some other data I'm not gonna show that uh, uh, shows that uh, you can do it so that, you do it in a way so it's, it's just impossible. Now one of the interesting things is you can take this full circuit, these are the red circles, and show that the data is working, but you can also cut this in two, and you build your algorithm, there's no connection between the left and right. That's a lot easier problem to solve, because it's, you know, it, it grows exponentially, so each halves are easy to solve. And that's the blue crosses, which more or less solves, so, uh, 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 agrees with the other. These more or less the same number of gates. You can do something in between. So you can check with easier calculation techniques that it's working okay. So um, 
I'm, I'm getting close to the end. I want to talk a little bit about the quantum science results. And the interesting thing on this here is this black line right here. The black line is the prediction from the gate and measurement errors that I showed you a few slides ago. Measuring one qubit, measuring two qubits, we can predict the error using a very simple formula for the fidelity. This is high school statistics, okay? This is really, really simple. And it basically shows that it works fine, and it's basically saying there's no new things that are going wrong in the circuit. Uh, and uh, it, it also from this data, you can see that the two to the, two to the 53 is this enormous, which we call the Hilbert space, where we're doing the calculation, and the quantum mechanics works at this scale. And this is good because uh, this is way beyond what people have done in the past, and it shows that the laws of quantum mechanics works as we expect it to work, even when we're doing this complex calculation. So that's really good for the future, that there's nothing practical or fundamental that's going on here. So just uh, one or two more slides. Of course, once you check out the quantum computer, you can actually start programming other kind of things that are useful. Uh, here's a series of algorithms that people have found interesting in physics. The total number of gates are a few hundred to a few thousand. So we're really starting to do quite complicated algorithms and we can get meaningful data out of it. It's not at the point of being useful in the sense that it beats a classical computer, but it does show that you can extract it and use it in practice uh, making, making the system. Okay, so with that, let me just give you a summary and outlook of what we've done in this experiment is, you know, taking all of the ideas we've learned over the last, uh, for me, it's been since the mid-1980s, among many other people, we were able to put that together and make a powerful quantum computer that solves this mathematical problem. But it shows that things are working. The next step is to actually do something useful. And to do that, I think it's gonna be quantum chemistry is a good application, but there are other ideas people have. But to do that, we're gonna to have to improve hardware, make the hardware better, and at the same time close the gap by figuring out new algorithms that don't require too many resources. And people are working on that to close the gap. And we're all excited about doing something useful because once you start doing something useful, and you know, to be honest, companies can start making money off it, and there's some value to it, then, you know, more resources get put into this, and we have a direction to go in, and then we can really start building the big quantum computer to solve the most important computational problems in the future, and, you know, we feel really excited that, uh, you know, a lot of interesting things will happen there. So that's what people are working at, and it's a really exciting time to be in this field to see all this happening. So with that, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to have you. I'm sorry, I, I'm, there's a lot of echo in this room and I have bad hearing. Here, is there? I can just talk. I, it's easier if you just, awesome. I'll just come up close to you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering, do you know uh, if there are any current uh, quantum computers that are able to do space instead of just a 2D lab machine? Yeah, so for 3D space, um, people are thinking about superconducting qubits that way. Um, there's photonic systems where people are, it's really about to be but having the, the, the fiber optics coming down in 3D. I would say right now what happens is the qubits being in 2D 
means you can bring the wiring and control system out in the third dimension. So that's kind of a useful kind of architecture for it to work. If you had 3D, then to bring the wires out would kind of be difficult and hard to do it. So I'm not saying that it's not a good idea. Uh, it, it's just not, you know, absolutely clear what's the best now. But 2D is the best. And the nice thing is the simple 2D architecture, which you can make on a chip, there's good theoretical beliefs through error correction surface code to believe you can build a quantum computer that way. And people are thinking about more complicated ways that might be better, but at least there's an existence proof that something that is reasonable to think about, uh, you know, it, it should, should work. And in fact, that's what happened. We understood that, we wrote a paper about this, and that really ch totally changed my project in around 2009, 2010, because I suddenly knew what to build. So uh, um, that, that was an interesting paper. The, the ideas behind it had been around for quite a few years, but I think for most people looking at it, it was like trying to understand string theory, okay? And all we did was translated it to a language that people could understand and made some simplifying calculations, and that really affected uh, the field a lot because people could understand it. And, uh, you know, and so that, that's just a, a message that you, know, you don't have to do the, the latest, greatest research. You can take something that's kind of known but explain it clearly, and that could make a big impact on the field. Certainly made a big impact of what we were doing with the experiment. So the technical advancements to improve the, um, what did you say? Any technical advancements just in the field of quantum computing or uh, sure. superconductors that have increased the odds? So, so yes, so people are making constant technical advancements in the field. You know, I reviewed a paper yesterday uh, you know, or two days ago to, to work on that. Um, for me, the real technical advancement that needs to be done is to make the error smaller. And right now, they're about a percent to a half percent, a little bit better. They've been getting better in the last few years, but we need to get those numbers below about 0.1% errors or lower. And um, that's, the, that's the critical number that I'm looking for in order to do that. And I think that's true of all the qubits, is um, that's the thing. Now, people are working on a wide variety of things. There's many things to fix and improve, but that, to me, is the key one. And we have some ideas on how to do the fabrication better to do something like that. Um, so, um, so, you know, right now people are making about 100 qubits, they aren't good enough, you're going to need to make 10 million to break RSA, okay? And it's taken, let's say, uh, 20 years to get to 100. So, you know, now there are groups like Google and IBM who are saying they're going to build a million qubit quantum computer in, uh, by the end of the decade, okay? And they have big big projects and, you know, and like, you think if, if, if people don't improve on the errors, they're never going to get there. But, um, you know, there are serious efforts now to build that kind of scale. And then you're going to give, you know, give them a few more years to get to 10 million or whatever you want. So, uh, you know, 10, 15 years, something like that. So it's, it's from 10 years, let's say from 10 years to infinity is the answer. <laughs> And, and my personal view is that I think the, and this was my, I gave a talk earlier on system engineering. My personal view is I think the physicists have been overly optimistic about, you know, this is really a hard thing to build. 
So um, people are working on it, but you know the chances of building something like this is, is not zero, so people are working on it. And they've been having a uh, program at NIST, the National Institute of Standard Technology, where I used to work, for five, seven years now, and they have a bunch, several algorithms that they know, uh, well, that they think will not be broken, and all the mathematician types are trying to break them and figure it out. There are companies who are implementing that. So uh, my feeling is if people got scared, they could, uh, they could field something in a year or two, but the more rational approach will be in five years or so that you'll have that. So I'm not worried at all that this can be done. It just has to be, you know, tested and fielded in a, in a good way. And of course, in like in the US government, they have all these crypto systems and they have to start planning for replacing it in, in you know, X years from now. So, but I'm gonna say, I think people are, we're gonna know along the way when certain very important things have been done. For example, the quantum supremacy experiment was one milestone but there are even more important ones. And then once those milestones get passed, then you know, people will ramp up the, the classical efforts. But I wouldn't worry, I, I feel that people have this under control. There are the algorithms. Yeah, they'll be a little bit less efficient, but you know, come on. Communications is really fast these days. Yes? I've got a question from a physicist friend who's watching on live stream. Oh, great. Thank you, I like that. Yeah, um, if any attempts for superconductivity ever becomes a thing, how might that improve quantum computing in general in your area of research in particular? Yeah, um, good, good question. At one point in my talk, I said what was critical was that K Boltzmann times T, the temperature, is less than the, the energy of the quantum system, which is H times frequency. So at five gigahertz, you want to be below 100 millikelvin. And if you use a high temperature superconductor, that doesn't really change. So if you want to go to higher temperatures, you have to go to higher frequencies. That's the key thing. So um, this is why people who do optical photons, they can operate at room temperature, although they actually operate at four Kelvin for other reasons. But you can potentially do that. So um, uh, uh, it, it, it it's, uh, has to do with the frequency of the qubit that matters, not uh, the superconductivity. And in fact, we use aluminum as a superconductor, which is a one Kelvin superconductor, and things like niobium is 10 Kelvin. So we're already using you know, low temperature superconductors right now, just because they work better from the materials point of view. And then usually all these high temperature superconductors are a nightmare to make. So, uh, you know, that makes it less likely. But uh, yeah, in the end, we, we choose the operating frequency we do because microwaves, getting microwave circuitry to work at five gigahertz is not very hard. I mean, that's what's in your cell phone. You can buy very inexpensive components. You can integrate it. And that really drives us. It's kind of, kind of funny that way. There was a question over here. I, I was wondering if there is a bottleneck in algorithms, right? So I, I'm assuming that, if, that you know, somebody's going to use generic circuits, knowing about AND gates and NOR gates and, and whatnot, and use that to create a circuit. But certainly if somebody's doing a quantum algorithm, they don't think in terms of square root and not gates, do they? Um, they call it a different name, but yes, they design their circuits around these kind of concepts. And they've been working on the, the physics of that. That being said, there are still a lot of things people have to learn about algorithms and encoding things. And a nice example, when I was at Google, there was uh, someone we hired who came from a computer science background and learned quantum computing on his own. Okay, not from any physics textbook. And then he uh, broke a theorem, okay, saying that if you want to make, um, I think it was a Toffoli game, that you could do it with uh, six of these operations instead of eight, okay? 
And of course, he didn't break the theorem, he broke the assumption of the theorem, and he changed the assumption because he's not a physicist thinking you have to do it that way. So yeah, things like this happen, and I think it's good that people are coming in from a computer science and a, uh, a mathematical way to look at it. But um, yeah, now remember, right now they know algorithms that would be interesting and useful, we just can't build it in hardware yet. But you know, we, you know, we know that if we build something big enough, we can start doing some interesting things. How interesting, whatever, you'd have to check out. But yeah, um, you know, there's still a lot to be done there. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there is. It's more of a practical limitation. But um, there, there's a, it has to do with um, the way that quantum mechanics, statistics of noise works. If you are at, as you go to lower and lower temperatures, your, the effect of temperature goes down exponentially. So there's a delta E over KT factor, standard Boltzmann kind of factor in it. Uh, so you know, you, you, you can get exponentially small noise. But the problem is, is if you do that, you have some higher hand temperature components always for us, and you have to exponentially filter that noise out from just sneaking into your circuit. So it just gets harder and harder to you know, take advantage of that. And uh, so it, it's not like there's a, there's a fundamental limit, but there's real good practical limits there. Also at low temperatures, it's very hard to equilibrate your temperature to whatever the thermometer is at. Uh, there's heat leaks and other things. So you have to spend a lot of effort on low temperature physics to get that to work right. But it looks doable. It's just, it's a little bit hard. And of course, people are working on making qubits at higher temperatures where, you know, hopefully things thermalize better and you won't have such a problem. But whatever you do, it's something hard. Okay, that's the, there's a conservation of hardness in, in building these experiments. And we have to figure out who's going to trick nature the best. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the way to think about it. There's one over here. Thank you. There's a question. Are you 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 looking for the prize? <laughs> <laughs> And share, excuse me, what? Your college experience. Okay. Um, so I went to high school in uh, San Pedro in the suburbs of, of Los Angeles. And my hobby at the time was electronics. So it's not surprising I'm doing something on that right now. I've always been building uh, custom electronics. I went to UC Berkeley as an undergraduate and did a nuclear physics experiment at the Bevatron where they discovered the antiproton. So that was my thesis, that was very interesting. And then I worked, stayed at Berkeley and worked with John Clark, who was just beginning research on these devices operating in the quantum regime. So I did some experiments and ending up for my thesis experiment demonstrating the first superconducting qubit. I, that was, I think, before the word qubit had been invented. So that was a prehistoric qubit. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I did a postdoc in France for a year and a half on the same thing. Then I moved to NIST in Boulder, Colorado, where I was working on experiments on quantum devices to count electrons to make an electrical standard. But I got diverted over time 
the first making uh, detectors of x-rays and photons using low temperature quantum devices, and then eventually got into quantum computing in around 2000. And then in 2004, went to UC Santa Barbara as a professor, and then that went really well, and in 2013, Google got interested in us, and I moved my whole research program to there. And then 2020, I left Google and doing uh, consulting work on a nuclear fusion company, a, uh, like a chat GPT kind of company, and trying to set up my own quantum computing company. So uh, I'm staying very busy. <laughs> I'm keeping out of trouble, as my wife would say. this question, I get it all the time. <laughs> and what happens is whenever you go talk to someone, you know, what's the best qubit? They always say, the qubit I'm working on is the best. And they'll start, you know, taking off a bunch of reasons for that. So it's very charming and interesting. So of course, superconducting qubits are the best. Okay. <laughs> now, um, the, the, the more nuanced story is what I gave at lunch talking about system engineering. And it's not like this one is better, you know, ours, we don't need a dilution refrigerator and blah, blah, blah. It's not one reason. It's a system engineering reason. And there's 10, 20, 30 reasons why something is, is better. And basically, you have to make it acceptable in 30 different dimensions in order to get that to work right. And you can never get a, an agreement between people on something that's 30 dimensional, right? It's just really complicated. Now what I think is, is it's fine for people to say the advantage of theirs. It's a little bit like a Twitter argument where you, know, you only talk about the good things and you don't talk about the bad things. Okay, so you know, hopefully we can all uh, this is a liberal arts college, you know how to go beyond that, you know. Uh, but in my view, it's great because all these different ideas are getting funded, and we just see what progress people make. And if they make a lot of progress in the next five, ten years, then it's a good idea. And if they don't make so much progress, then it's, you know, kind of hard, fundamentally hard. So we just have to wait and see what happens. Um, just to plug, superconducting qubits, okay? You have this idea based on all of your electronics that smaller transistors are better, and there's good reasons to believe that. But as I mentioned in this talk, if you make it too small, it's hard to bring your control circuits into it because you have external control circuits. That's not how this works, okay? This has self-control circuits built in. So there's an advantage of superconducting qubits because they're so large. And because they're large, you have room to bring in the wires and your control circuits and to do everything. If it's too small, that gets different. It's called escape wiring. Okay, so that, that gets difficult. So, um, you know, we'll see what people, um, people can figure out there. But you're, you're into, you have to reset your intuition. So it's so easy to just blindly follow what's worked with CMOS and to say that's what you have to do 
I mean, certainly you should think about it, but uh, the, the requirements are really much richer and more difficult. And those of you who were at lunch, you know, I tried to point that out a little bit. Okay? I, I'm, I, I have bad hearing. Can you say it again, Bobby? So quantum compute? Does that mean how currently they're going to give up to read something? How what? How? Because they have quantum skill there, then the computer can get there. Then the classroom can do that will give up to read. Oh, no, OK. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you, you will never make a classical computer obsolete because the quantum algorithms can't solve any, every classical algorithms. It's like a coprocessor that only solves certain problems, which I kind of mentioned. And the other thing is when you build a quantum computer with this error correction or whatever, you're gonna need a supercomputer helping to operate the quantum computer and figuring out the errors and the like. So uh, in fact, it's quite a serious computational challenge. So it's all there. It, it's better to think of it as a coprocessor for solving certain problems, hope, which will hopefully expand over time. I, I, I'm sorry. I, Yes, yes, people have done that. Yes, you, you can do that. And an example in this uh, the experiment I talked about, we inserted an error and our cross entropy fidelity went to zero. So we, we, you know, we do that. And people have done other experiments where they insert errors and they know it. And it's kind of tricky because you would think that a, an error in quantum mechanics is kind of subtle and difficult. And it turns out you can mostly think of it as a classical bit flip or phase flip and what it does. Yeah, and, and there's kind of a, this quantization of error uh, idea that comes across. I have data I, I didn't show. Uh, so uh, it, it's really kind of unusual. And it's, it's fortuitous that the computation is very rich and powerful, but the errors is kind of like high school math. Okay, so <laughs> it's, 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 it's surprising to me. So solve that with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there are, OK, so one of the ideas we have to bring the wires in is for the company, and we're patenting it, so I can't talk about it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, there are, there, there, are, there are ways to make the wires in a very clever way that you can deal with the, the large amount of it. Uh, but I'm going to say it's a little bit brute force. And the real issue is you have to build this control system. These, eight, these waveform generators really dissipate a lot of power. And uh, you kind of want them at room temperature or maybe at 77 Kelvin where they'll operate okay, uh, but you still have the problems of getting all the wires down. So I, I actually thought about this for quite a few years, and uh, we think we have a good solution, but you know, we have to test it. Oh, the slide where we, yes, where we made the, the qubit. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I, 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 I like building things, so. So this is a scanning electron microscope like you guys have here. And what we have is, um, is uh, from the bottom here, like the ground plane, we have a wire coming in here. And then we put oxygen in, and that forms aluminum oxide tunnel barrier, which is an insulator, but very thin. 
and then we come and put another wire on top of it that crosses it. So, so it's, it looks like that. Can, can, can you say that again? I'm Come up after the lecture and, and point to it. I, I, yeah. It, it, it's, oh, by the way, it's magic that this really simple process works so well. And if it didn't, I wouldn't be talking to you today. <laughs> okay? And it's a, it's a real gift from nature. And it turns out that that Josen junction and that oxide basically has zero defects in it. Zero. And there's some various reasons. So, uh, you know, that, that's why we can, we can, we can make this thing at all. It's really a gift.